And if possible, I might have an interview with, if it works out, with Kevin O'Donnell. In case you don't know him, he's one of the guys. Hold on. Hello? Hello? Yes, who is this? Oh, guys, this is Kevin O'Donnell. Oh, speak on the mic, Kevin. Hello? Uh, hello, this is this is Kevin O'Donnell, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the guy who worked for with Liberty's Kids. Um, so like, t um, how are you? How are you, Kevin O'Donnell? I'm <laughs> good, thank you. So where where am I calling into? Is this your college station? Yeah, this is the same Peters at WSPR. I'm I'm sorry, I, I don't like. I'm a freshman and like uh, I know I'm a noob, so <laughs> don't mind me. <laughs> okay. All right. What can I what can I do for you? What, what, what questions can I answer? Um. Well, it's a pretty long, uh, pretty long. Uh, well, not that long, but like I got a few questions. Like, well, first introduce yourself, what you do, expl like explain it. All right. Well, who, who is the audience that we're talking to? Well, today? this is this is anybody who's listening to um. Well, anybody on the campus and anybody who's on St. Peter, www.stpeters.edu slash WSPR. My show is The Blazing okay, well, Show with Chris. Oh, I, uh, oh uh, how rude of me. I almost forgot to say welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I, my background is in educational television. Uh, probably my best known show is Liberty's Kids, which was yep. on PBS for a number of years. Uh, yep, that, that, that's, that's the real history right there, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, so my area of expertise is in using animation, uh, TV, and interactive to try and educate kids. Uh, and I've remained involved with that. I've done quite a few projects in that area. So anyone that is interested in that process of how to take education into a new way, into a new area, uh, that's, that's what I focus on. Right now I'm, I'm doing a project on how to take uh, language education to children around the world and use animated shows and interactive gaming to revolutionize the way kids learn language. That's my current project. Nice. Um... I feel kind of bad every time I think about it. like Liberty's Kids. I would, there's only reruns. I think it was on this channel. I forgot the name. Maybe some branch of history. Um, but like it only reruns, but no new episodes. Like exactly. But well, um, we 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 did 40 episodes, uh, and we took it from the the very first shot of the revolution all the way through the creation of the Constitution. So we. There really is no more episodes necessarily to be done. Uh, we we covered everything that we had hoped to do uh, in, in that. If we were going to do more, we've had some talk of potentially doing some about the Civil War, uh, the same approach. But in terms of the American Revolution, we've done what we set out to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> by the way, uh, it's, it's a hell of a show, I have to admit. Unfortunately, you're like one of the only people that are like you can actually contact because like uh, I don't know where everybody is. Everybody's like I don't like wherever. Who knows where they are? Um, can you explain what led up to where you are now? Like like whatever you feel comfortable. Like this is well, it's not necessarily about like well just just explain like what what you what you feel like um led up to where you are now is it from like. Beginning your like like well, in, early in, in, in yeah. terms of uh, in terms of what I do in terms of career wise yeah yeah like journey and career wise. Well, I started I started uh, in animation back in the eighties, uh, quite a while ago. The first show I was ever involved with was a show called Gadget, and I stayed focused in uh, the area of kids education. I ran a company, I ran the production for a company called Beak Entertainment that did things like Strawberry Shortcake. Uh, we did uh, the Mario Brothers, Ghostbusters cartoon, Dennis the Menace, etc. And then I started doing my own shows writing my, and writing for other people. And then I created a, a few different shows in the 90s and then I did Liberty's Kids. And I most recently created a show that will be on PBS next year about Thomas Edison. A, a fun show for kids, and um, yeah, we need to so get that. Yeah, I just got involved with cartoons. Uh, learned about stories.
story, learned about structure, character design, etc. And then decided that we could do more in education by by bringing that same type of approach to it. So I made the shift and did a lot of games with the, the Star Wars characters and um, about 10, 15 years ago and and uh, just kept going forward until um, I, over time I started to become known for doing this and so people came to me and asked me to do other things and, and that brings me to today where I'm very much focused on you know, projects to kind of change the way kids learn languages. Well, um, nice. Um, hang in there, Kevin. Um, oh. Hello. Hey, uh, Chris O'Donnell. Hi. This is uh, Ricardo Jesus. I'm uh, one of the members of WSPR Radio. Uh, I just came in to help out Chris. This is one of his first shows, so I thought it'd be a good idea to come in. And I'm hearing the yeah. show. And um, first off, thank you for your time and helping us out with and helping uh, Chris out for a show. This is your this is your second show, is it right, Chris? Yeah. yeah. So I know that's been you know you're getting there and you're working your butt off for this, and I appreciate that, Chris. I remember. Liberty's Kid very fondly. It was one of those shows that I really was getting into because it was a, it was originally in PBS. Am I right? Yeah, we did it in partnership with PBS, and then after PBS, it played for about ten years on different channels. Um, after that, it's now it's still used in a lot of classrooms uh, and it's broadcast online, but it's not on TV right now. Oh uh, yeah, I remember um, be seeing it when I was in uh, elementary and middle school. It was one of those shows that was definitely very creative, bringing a sense of story in the American Revolution, but with involved these kids, you know, the characters. Can I ask um, for your format? What was some of the key goals when it comes to making this cartoon, this show, educational for students? Because when you see a cartoon and trying to relate it to history in some way, it gets a little bit tricky, I would imagine. So what was the approach for you and other people when it comes to the sh to Liberty's Kids? What was that approach like for you, and what was it? What were the key factors needed to make sure that this show was successful? Well, uh, basically with kids, it doesn't matter whether it's educational or, or not. The key is your characters. And so we created a set of characters that were very relatable to kids. We had we had a teenage girl who was coming to America in search of the American dream and her father who had, had come over before. She was met by a, uh, a young guy about her same age who was trying to be a reporter for uh, the Pennsylvania Gazette, and the two of them were really the core of the show. We added a younger uh, boy to it and, and an older man then who was the adult figure, and every those were our four fictional characters, and everybody else they came in contact with was a true historical figure. We used a lot of the real quotes. We put them in real situations. We Every show had two stories. One tended to be a political slash war story, so it was either about a battle or something that was going on, the politics of the actual fight uh, for uh, American freedom. The other story tended to be a social story, whether it was about one person's life dealing with something such as uh, a disease that may have been on at that time or a social disease like slavery, etc. So we... We looked at our whole spread of 40 shows. We broke down the Revolutionary War into 40 different segments that were deemed extremely important. We worked with a lot of top uh, historians on this, and then so we divided that into 40 different key battles, political movements, etc. In each of those, we then identified key characters that we wanted to introduce, as well as the ongoing set of characters, obviously like a Ben Franklin, George Washington, etc., John Adams that would be in most episodes. And then we also looked at the social movements of the time, uh, women starting to gain more of a voice, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the issues of too, slavery, right? of indentured servitude, yep. of, of the expansion of the country, etc. And then once we had identified all that, we put it all together and started writing our stories. Uh, nice, it's uh, excellent. Like so, uh, it's one of my favorite shows, and like with, with what's going on around the country, like we we need shows like this, especially. Yeah. 
Uh, one of the things that I, I remember hearing when it came to Liberty uh, Kids was that it was it was definitely a, a, a really int- a great story. It was, and it was educational in every sense of the way. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed though now, because like now people can watch it anywhere. You can find it online through social media. People like to so bring it up every now and then when they think about their time ten years ago. When you think about Liberty Kids back then, which was I believe it would be about a good decade ago where the show was first airing, and when you see it now with social media getting popular and everything like that, would you have tried to change up, well, not the format of the show, but how do you see Liberty Kids standing now when it comes to you know, education now with, with the more computers being utilized or more technology because now education is a lot more different than it was 10 years i can see that for my middle school i didn't see a lot of people use as many computers as now with middle school so how do you see that now well what we did actually holds up quite well because we were telling stories so stories work no matter what the technology is um when we did this which was right around the early 2000s um, social media didn't exist at that time, but interactive gaming did. We really focused on the story elements, and we, we made a calculated decision that long-form television, half-hour-based storytelling would always have a role. Um, I think that's been played out and is successful and, and does work. We did do a series of cut-down smaller episodes for online, but I don't think they have the same impact. I mean, nowadays what I'm doing, um, the last show I created is was a television show was still very similar, but where most of my focus is is on um, projects that utilize all aspects of interactivity. And I'm doing a project now on the language learning that utilizes storytelling characters and then flows right into interactive gaming and is all tied together so the experience a child has in this case uh, it, it incorporates all elements of the of the types of ways that they consume content so uh, that's really the, the big difference is that nowadays a child who a young child is just growing up completely adept at all levels of, of interactivity. And so if you don't think about that in the process of how you're going to teach them, you are leaving, uh, you're leaving some opportunities uh, at the door. So um, we're, we tend to think a little bit shorter. We tend to think in terms of gaming components, uh, interactivity, levels of engagement with the kids that um, we didn't back then, but it doesn't really matter in terms of uh, back then because the stories still hold up and the stories are still used in the classroom, and because it's a period piece, um, they work just fine. If I was going to do it again today, I may have taken the individual stories and broken them up a little bit more and given more of an opportunity to play with them, and I could even potentially take it into uh, an Xbox game or something like that. But I'm quite happy with the way we did it. Um, and th- that's an amazing story. Um, Kevin, um, Kevin, can you hang? Well, ha- well, I'm not. I'm actually decided not to hang up. But like, th- we gotta go into a break now. When we come back, you're gonna. Um, uh, well, actually, I do have. Um, don't the one of the things you should know, like when you're interviewing someone, don't try to, especially uh, on the phone. No, uh, don't try. There is um when you were talking, you were talking about interactivity now, and well, like when you're working on this, you you mentioned before you're doing new um creative new shows, new ideas, new projects. What are your thoughts on having to you you know you're you're constantly evolving, constantly trying to think of new ideas like. Well, do you try to go with new shows on with the same format, like the same brainstorming questions? How do you brainstorm these ideas and make it into the product that you're trying to give to to everyone? Well, over time of doing this, uh, first of all, I, I don't typically try and come up with a specific idea. Sometimes I do. I, there's a new show that um, that that focuses on. Uh, Thomas Edison, and so I was asked to come up with a show, and so I came up with an idea, 
it's really from just having done it a number of years. So what I kind of do is I have a process I go through, a brainstorming process that I kind of lock myself in a room. I put all my thoughts on either on the computer or up on a wall, and I just start to narrow in on what interests me. And the, the biggest thing for me when I'm looking to develop something is, is there a character that I think kids are going to like? And I'm always thinking in terms of when I, you know, somebody who is anywhere from four to nine years old, how are they going to relate to that character? What's going to be exciting about it? And so once I zero in on a subject area that I want to do, I start to look at what's the setting, who's the main character, what are they focused on, what do they care about? And as I start to just answer simple questions, uh, and not necessarily profound questions, but as I start to identify elements of the character, the characters tend to come to life. And once the character comes to life and you've put them in a setting, you've given them a conflict, and you have them in a situation where they've got to start to figure things out, then the whole world starts to come to life. It's not a super fast, simple process. It's a lot of work. Uh, but there's a methodology to it that anyone can really do. Uh, and I work with a lot of young writers and a lot of young people, and uh, what I tend to tell them is creativity is really the, a process, and it's a process of hundreds of very simple, small decisions, but when you make them all, and you've made all these decisions about your characters, you have a mosaic that is put together correctly, gives you a very good, clear view of a specific character, and then if you start to put that specific character into settings that kids can relate to, whether they're uh, normal settings or they're surreal settings, it doesn't really matter. As long as you know your character and have the character or characters uh, go into each scene with real motivations and, re and you know who they are, you can come up with a show that's really engaging. But you have to first answer hundreds of questions about your character uh, so that you know who they are. Questions that most people would never even think of. Everything from what do they like to do when they're bored to what are they best at, what do they want to be when they grow up, etc., etc., etc. You just have to make the decisions. And once you've done it enough, then you're the person who's created the character and you know how they react no matter what the situation is. That's unbelievable. Um, another question, a question I had was actually uh, pretty important, well, very actually. Um, what does it take for a kid's show to be made, explain the process, and how hard it really is? Well, it's a, you know, it depends. If you want it to be on a venue that everybody has access to, like a PBS television network, then it's a very hard process because of the, the fact that a large number of people have to agree, a large no amount of money has to be spent, a large amount of energy has to be focused on it, and you have to get a large number of people working on it, probably in a number of different countries. So to try and launch a television show is a multi-million dollar effort that takes a number of years to do. If you're, however, you have a concept to yourself and you've got the ability to draw, or you have a friend that draws, you could do a YouTube channel that really comes down to you and you and a friend or a couple friends making your own content right in your own garage or or shooting a live action with your with your phone. So it's it, it really depends on how far uh, how how far you want to take it in terms of a market ready distribution system. Um, if you're going to try and put it on, like I said, PBS or onto NBC or primetime channel, it's a very different endeavor. But a lot of people have great ideas. They have things that they think would be good. And the access today to put it out onto something like YouTube and then share it with friends, if something's really good, it will eventually rise to the top if it gets enough, uh, if there's somebody behind it who believes it. Oh, that's a long process. How much do you think it would cost like for each episode? You might have said like hundreds of thousands of dollars per episode. That's insane. Well, that's that's full of It's oh. it's uh, you know it's very expensive to to put all the attention on a show that that it takes. Uh, 
there's you know, hundreds of people that are involved, and, and what you're really paying for is people's time. And so if you're doing a show that takes thousands of hours to make, and you add up everybody from the writers to the voiceover actors to the artists to the animators to the post-production people, it's like you've got to pay for that time. So that's what the cost comes in. Wow. Uh, my next question is, what, is, what was the real truth of why Liberty's Kids doesn't have new episodes but reruns and where you can still see the show? Because I thought it was just money and stuff, but I, I didn't know the real truth. Well, it, it, it can be seen on the web. There's a, there's a couple places where the episodes are available, but the real reason there aren't new episodes is uh, what we talked about earlier, that uh, in terms of the American Revolution, there's no need to do more. We... Uh, we really laid out what we wanted to do. Uh, to do more Liberty's Kids, uh, to do new ones, to do different type, parts of American history, that gets into a whole business uh, dealing at times and the studios that were sold and the, the show was sold in a library of episodes. And there's, um, it could be done, but it would take um, a lot of unraveling. There's a lot of legal aspects to it. Um, so um, I I thought about doing some new with these kids books, which which I could do. Uh, but the reality is, I'm very happy with Liberty's kids. I love what we did uh, for myself. Uh, I'm really focused in on some new things and moving forward. And I may at one point write um, write some new Liberty's kids books. But there's you know whenever you do a TV series. Uh, there's a lot of components. I, I don't control. Um, uh, I don't control the whole series. It's been sold a couple times, so there's always business elements that would have to be unwound and and figured out, and that takes a lot of energy. And I'm focusing my energy more on new things that I haven't created yet. Well, because um, there's a bunch of things that happened, like, recently. Do you think there might be a chance we can adapt those topics there somehow? That is a good uh, point to make up. I was, uh, my question was, like, you see how the American Revolution changed the shape America is now. What It, it, it basically gave us what America, what the birth of America. But when you see America... <laughs> America now with the situations that been going on and you have a situ you know you have you can put stories with stuff involving you know the World Trade Center uh, tragedy and also just recently yesterday the whole situation with Ferguson there's lots of topics that you know that could could be adapted for sh uh, for shows involving children so that they can get a better understanding what are your thoughts on on those topics and do you think that those topics can be used to create more like stories on, on shows for children well, I, I think they will be. I think that uh, people will come along and they'll, they'll look at these things. When we did Liberty's Kids, we, if you look at the stories we did, they, they were very uh, similar to things in the headlines today. We were dealing with things like taxation, gun control, uh, violence, all kinds of issues, that women's rights, the rights of minorities uh, in America. Those issues continue to... Uh, find their way to the, the headlines. I mean, watching Ferguson light up last night, uh, you see those things are still being played out. And it's for, you know, uh, new writers and new, uh, new young producers and creators to look at those things and say, okay, this, uh, we still need to address this. We need to address racism in America. We need to address issues like guns and, and, and violence and how do we make our neighborhoods safer and how do we let democracy grow in a time when you have digital democracy and, and all these different elements. Uh, I think that the questions we dealt with in the revolution and the American Revolution were really about the freedom of people to govern themselves. That's what had not happened up to that point. Up to that point in the world, it had always been ultimately who had the the biggest army was who was who ruled the land. So America was the first democracy that was handed over peacefully from one rule to the next. So the challenges that come with that are still the biggest challenges we face. We're trying to improve our democracy. Uh, we have other countries around the world trying to get democracy, and then others that are thinking maybe there's something better than democracy opposed to uh, democratic movement. 
so that, that's for young writers like yourself, for young producers like yourself to look at it and think, wouldn't it be cool if we had a game that where we could crowdsource all the issues in Ferguson and use social media to, to try and create a solution that would take a city like that forward and out of the rage and into a, a better future. Well, um, that that is awesome. Personally, I'm for the Second Amendment. I'm, I think gun control is ridiculous, personally. And as far as democracy, was was one of the quotes I think, from Ben Franklin. Democracy is like the worst, worst form of government because the 51% can enslave the 49%. Um, my next question is, what would it take for... Um, oh, uh, before that, sorry. Um, why do cartoons go off air and even some are left with cliffhangers like Aaron Stone? Aaron Stone was left with, like one of the guys stepped into the chamber, but like we'll never know what happened. Like, what is the deal with that? In your own perspective. Is this Aaron Stone. Yeah, I think, I yeah. think what you mentioned, like certain shows have this certain way, like think about The Sopranos at the end of The Sopranos. You don't see, I remember there was a certain park, you're at a diner, then bam. You, it goes into black, and you don't see an ending to that. And then some other situ- shows as well, like that doesn't really be per- aren't perplexed or like are too perplexed for us to un- to comprehend. You had a situation with the season, the series finale of Lost, or even twenty four, twenty four. Well, uh, well, here's what happens in all these situations. First of all, money is the biggest determining factor in most situations. Shows got canceled because they're making too much money. Shows are canceled because the ratings have started to dry up. There's not enough revenue. Um, or because the creative force behind them has started to dry up with ideas. In terms of how a show like The Sopranos is going to end, that's purely in the hands of the creator of the series and uh, determining whether or not he wants to leave it open-ended or he wants to give it a, a real close. Uh, most shows uh, don't get the luxury of uh, being able to determine that because they tend to go off the air while they, um, you know, not of their own volition. A show like Lost, that came full circle. They were able to make up their own decision. Uh, you know, how that's done is really depends on whoever created it and who's controlling the creative on it decides to do it. In most cases, it's a little bit messy, but... You have to look at most television, most movies, most most content you 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 uh, see. The reason it's being made is because somebody had a an idea and they had the drive to push that idea forward. But ultimately, it was because there was somebody that could make money, you know, spreading that out for people. And and so you can't forget that component of it. There. Are, you know, we did, uh, with these kids, we, I think we had a good, valid reason for doing it. We thought it would be helpful, but there was also a business. It also cost $12 million. Wow. Yeah, you know, so those, those dollars are extremely important uh, for people to recoup, to have business plans. So you can't divorce the business from the creative in, in most cases. So every show has got its own story. Um, on how it was created, how it went, how it played out, who got to say what happens. You know, there's multiple people involved creatively. You have networks, you have executives of studios, you have uh, the writers, you have so many people tied into these things that each one, if you were to go study any series that you like, if you were to go study it, you would be able to find a very unique story um, probably with a lot of passion, uh, probably with some people that were very upset, some people that were very happy. Um, I've been involved with a lot of shows, and each one has had its own journey. Um, and it's not something you can undertake lightly. So in terms of how they go off the air and how, why they're left hanging or this or that, you have to treat each one as a specific case. Um. On the question I was about to ask before, what would it take for cartoons to go back on air and some that are like to improve, etc.? Well, what do you mean by on the air, Chris? Like, yeah, because some cartoons I don't even see anymore. Like, I'm talking about in general. Oh, and, li- and Liberty's Kids, for to be, let, let's say hypothetically, I always talk like that, to make new episodes. What would it take for Liberty Kids? Let's, let's pick, speak about that one in particular. Like, well, for Liberty Kids to go back on the air, first of 
first of all, it's very different nowadays because you can you can access the videos, uh, you can access the episodes online. There's a, there's a big uh, DVD set that's out there. Uh, you can access it already. For to go on to a television network and new episodes. Um, there's a lot and new episodes. It takes it takes somebody who has a desire to do that and thinks they can put put it together in a way that's going to generate a lot more funds than what, than what it costs. I mean, it, it could happen, but it would take. Uh, in, in the case of Liberty's Kids, there's a gentleman by the name of Andy Hayward and myself. That were the two biggest driving forces, and Andy from the business side drove it forward and made it happen, and I made it happen from the creative side. Um, but it takes some people that are going to be willing to put huge amounts of energy out there and uh, and then also to put the funding behind it and then have the whole business in place to make that uh, profitable. And uh, so it, it, it depends. It, it can happen. But uh, in the case of Liberty's Kids, whereas people really like it and it's viable, you know, that's a case where we did what we set out to do. Um, we wanted to help kids understand the American Revolution. So there's not a big drive to do more because our, our ongoing focus is not to make more money off it, per se. It was we did it well, and it remains a positive force out there. Um, but there's nobody tied to the original show who is dedicating their life to make more episodes happen. We're very, I think in general, everybody's pretty happy with what we accomplished. Yeah. In addition, there's a lot of other factors involved too. Like for example, not every show, that every series has to be on the uh, television. I think that what they're doing now, with Netflix for example, you have the Orange is the New Black, or you have certain shows that are now on only for web-based episodes. Like, for example... Exactly. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's very different now. Yeah. There's, the, the buyers are very different. The, the cycles, the number of episodes you do, whether it is you know episodic or whether it's interactive, if it's a combination, there's a hundred different business models now. There's a hundred different places to go with things. So it is very different. And one other, and it, for example, like I know you're so familiar with, I guess, children's show too. But they did one with Nickelodeon with uh, the last uh, Airbender spinoff, uh, Korra, um, Avatar Korra. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I've heard of the show. They, um, they base it was originally on the air on live for the third season, a, a second season, I believe. But what ended up happening was they took it off the off the television there and they just played it on stream because they felt like they had a higher, uh, a good audience online and also there was also some situation debatable situations involving the airtime some says some say it said it was involving they were producing too many shows too fast doing hour long specials they're, they're trying to speed up the series which in which in part is understandable because you don't want to just like all of a sudden in two weeks just end your series just like that there's a it's, it's like saying if for Liberty's Ki Liberty Kids they were gonna show all 40 episodes in like n two weeks, which is absurd or impossible. First mm -hmm. off, and secondly, it just be it, it would just seem too much and not right in some way. Yeah, it, it's a very different uh, time now. It's actually much easier nowadays to get things exposed. Uh, it's no easier to create a hit, but it's. It's because there's more places to take shows. Uh, when I did Liberty's Kids, there just weren't that many places to, that could fund a show. Uh, now there are a lot more, but because there's a lot more, it's actually harder to get something that uh, enough people see. So it's you know it's always changing. There's always new formats. There's new concepts, new motivations, but uh, you still kids are kids. And, and ultimately what they want are really good stories with really good characters, and if it can be interactive, even better. Yeah. So it's a, it's a that, whole that, new world. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, um, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, what, I was thinking about of Great Deadly O, or the Great Delilah, actually, <laughs> we say the other way, and Tara Strong, and that brings to the question, how can you be a producer like they are and you have been? Because that sounds like a lot of fun, and I... 
and I, I would love to my stuff to be on TV, etc. Like where the process. Well, to be to be a producer, I mean, just I mean, very simply, to be a producer just means that you figured out how to get your stuff on TV. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in that type of thing, the best thing to do is to start working with a company that puts shows on television and learn from the bottom up. Uh, during the course of my career, I've done everything from direct to write to finance uh, to edit shows. You know, ultimately, as a producer, what that really means is you've made it happen and whatever in whatever form that takes. That means you have to find somebody with money, you have to find creative people, you need to have good ideas, you need to convince a distributor to put it on the air. So if you want to be a producer, the best way to be a producer is to find a company that's putting on the kind of programming you like, whether it's interactive or linear programming, and go find a way to start with them. I started in the mail room for Dick Clark Productions long, long ago. You know, it's typically people kind of start at the bottom and work their way up and just learn. And then you have an idea, you get passionate about it, and you figure it out. And that's, that's really the key. And, uh, guys, I'm going to have to leave you on that note because I've oh. got to uh, cut out to a... To oh. a uh, Oh, um, one, one quick thing, um, well, actually, I might as well combine them. How can, you, uh, how can others help you out, and how can you help other producers out, and what about the future of kid shows? Can you tell us that, those two things, but, like, combine it with, like, one answer quickly I, before I, you go? Yeah, like, what do you, where do you see the future of children educational shows in general? Like, The Reese Kids was a great show. There, I still remember it. Do you think there's still going to be a future for the for, for children's show? And how can this help? Here's where it's going. Kids' education is more and more important all the time because we live in an information age. If you're not intelligent and educated, it means your chance to succeed at a high level in an information-based society is much lower than it used to be. So what does that mean? It means that parents are more focused on their children's education than ever before. It means that governments are more focused on their education. So what people are looking for are new products that engage kids at younger ages all the time, but then can put them on a path to learning that will help them ultimately achieve skills and uh, acquire skills that they can use in the new world. That means shows that are about programming computers, building robots, thinking logically, trying to understand higher concepts. Those are all going to have a place in the future of educational programming, and it'll ultimately go from the cradle all the way up through college. So anybody that's trying to go in that field will find that there's a big audience for it, and ultimately success will be based on creating something that kids love. And when you want to create something that kids love, what that always comes back to at the end of the day is characters they can relate to, in storylines that engage them. Um, how so can we um, how can we help? By the way. Oh, um, well, um, as before you go, um, tell us quickly how can you help others like me and Ricky and a bunch of other people. What would you tell us? Advice, etc. Well, what I would say is, if you want to, uh, if you want to create shows, I would start doing things on YouTube. I would start thinking through a. Uh, I would start to list out what it is you want to accomplish. First of all, do you want to, who do you want to reach as an audience? Determine who your audience is. Are they kids? Are they adults? Are they teens? And then once you determine what your audience is, then talk about what do you want your programming to do. Do you want to educate them, inspire them? Do you want to just entertain them? Get a real good sense and then think about other things that are kind of like that that you would like to do. Study those, look at how they did them, and then start to talk about, okay, if we were going to do this type of a program for this type of an audience that would get them to think about this, then who are the key characters? What would they be like? And then where would we put them? And one by one, just start checking off the boxes. Who are our characters? Where do they live? What's their world like? Who do they encounter? What types of problems do they face? How do they... How do they face those problems? What kinds of decisions do they make when they're in trouble? Who's cool? Who's excitable? Et cetera, et cetera. And one by one, kind of knock these things down and then say, okay, 
with what resources can we do get to make this? If you have no resources, then you're going to write it and you're going to put it out as a book. If you've got resources such as cameras and acting, you know, actors, you're going to do something for a YouTube channel to distribute. Then once you put something onto video, you're going to take it to people that you can get to to look at it if they think there's an audience for it. Ultimately, if you want to be able to produce TV shows or movies or big games, you've got to show the ability to create something that engages audiences. So know who your audience is, determine what you want to do with that audience, then figure out the characters that are going to be at the center of that experience, and then start outlining the world and take it from there. Oh, oh okay. Um, thank you very much for your time. You can um, just let me know when um, you're welcome to come back next time. Um, this is um, Christopher Tinajero and Ricky, and um, it's, it's, it's been an honor. It. It's thank been an honor. Much. We appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much, Kevin O'Donnell. All right. Thank, thank you very much, guys. Good uh, luck with your show. You thank too. you. Have th happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. That has been Kevin O'Donnell on um, Liberty's Kids. That, that's a hell of a guy. What do you think, Ricky? And he definitely has some insight, knows what he's doing, very creative. You know, be, yeah, there's, Liberty's Kids was a great example of that. It was a good show. Well, I hope we can get him on um, real soon and hope that project goes well with him.